Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today we're talking about how to get more compliments from your man. I'm going to share three steps to inspiring him to say sweet things to you. After being abandoned by her first husband, my guest Deb was hopeless that she could ever fix her second marriage to a pastor, which had grown unbearably tense, hostile, and lonely. With a blended family of nine children, she had a lot at stake. A solo road trip was the start of a journey in healing and growing her marriage, which is now a source of strength. Then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week, which, no joke, pretends to prevent blowups, but actually causes them. All that's coming up, but first let's talk about how to get more compliments from your man. When you were dating, your husband probably wooed you with words. He most likely told you how pretty you looked, how nice you are, and that he found himself thinking about you at work. Maybe he said he thought you were so sexy it was distracting and that he loved your beautiful smile and he liked you better than anyone he'd ever dated. Then he even said he thought you were so much smarter than the average bear and that he liked your sense of style, your humor, or the way you smelled. But your man hasn't said any of those things for a long time and you're starving to hear praise from him now. Here are three simple steps to inspire him to compliment you again. Number one, stop lying about how your husband never compliments you. Okay, so that was a little harsh just now when I accused you of lying about your husband never complimenting you. What I was trying to say is that never is a long time. It's very hard for anybody to live up to. That's why I suspect you're exaggerating when you say that he never compliments you. Maybe what you mean to say is that he rarely compliments you and, like me, you sometimes use hyperbole. Here's why I'm picking apart the semantics. It says something about what you're focused on. And that's significant because what you focus on increases. If your focus is that he never compliments you, then every time he doesn't, that reinforces your belief that he never does and probably never will, which feels awful. I know rarely doesn't sound much better than never, but if he rarely compliments you, that means he sometimes compliments you. And if he sometimes compliments you and what you want is more of that, why not focus on those times and see what happens? If that doesn't seem logical, consider all the times you've noticed so many people driving the same car that you just bought right after you got that car when you never noticed them before. The only difference was what you were focused on. Number two, catch him doing something good. That first step, focusing on when he compliments you, is critical because without it, you won't be able to do this next step, which is to catch him in the act of complimenting you and go bananas with happiness about it. Instead of complaining that he doesn't compliment you enough, which is not very inspiring, wait for him to do the very thing you want him to do more of and then pounce on him with appreciation and happiness. It doesn't even have to be a big compliment. You could start small. Here's what I mean. Let's say you made some soup, or let's say you bought and heated up some soup. And let's assume further that your husband says, this soup is pretty good. That's kind of a compliment, right? That is your big chance to smile, to let him know you are happy to hear that and that you appreciate the compliment. See what just happened there? You gave him positive reinforcement that him giving you a compliment makes you happy. And since he feels good when he makes you happy, that's going to inspire him to compliment you more. And you might be thinking that that is not the kind of compliment I want him to give me. And it's true. That is not a very personal or special compliment. But if he sees that he can delight you when he talks about the soup, he's going to look for more and better ways to say things that make you happy. You may have been thinking the opposite, that you should withhold your appreciation until he says that you're the most beautiful woman in the world, or that he's so glad he's married to you, or that he can't live without you. I know! I thought the same thing. I thought the way to teach people what I wanted from them was to let them know I wasn't happy until they got it right. It turns out that doesn't work at all. That's not inspiring. But catching him doing something good, well, that is inspiring. It's it's surprisingly effective in teaching others how to treat you well, which is something we're all doing all the time. Number three, receive graciously. 
And step two, besides explaining how you can catch him doing something good, I also described what it looks like to receive graciously, which is absolutely vital for turning the clock back to when your man couldn't shut up about how wonderful you are. No compliments will be forthcoming until you practice this intimacy skill, which is the essence of femininity and will also make you 10 times more attractive as you get better at it. It doesn't matter if you've been out of practice for a while, you can start receiving graciously right now. He'll get the message that you're open to letting him delight you again when he sees you smiling and saying thank you. Truth be told, he's been waiting for his opportunity to make you happy again, and following these three steps will help him see his chance to do that by telling you how nice you are and how lucky he is to have you. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. After being abandoned by her first husband, my guest Deb was hopeless that she could ever fix her second marriage to a pastor. The marriage had grown unbearably tense, hostile, and lonely. And with a blended family, including nine children, she was confused, bewildered, and looking for escape. Then a solitary road trip led her to another kind of journey. And along the way, she discovered the levers to healing and growing her marriage which is now a source of strength. Deb, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thanks for being here today. It's a joy, and I'm so glad to be here. Oh, I can't wait for everyone to hear your story. So take us, but take us back to, well, where should we start here? Where should we start with your story? I want to start in the bad old days. I want to know about the pain that you were in, why you were feeling so bewildered and lonely. Well, I suppose for me, I had thought that my second marriage, which I had waited for eight years to find Mr. Wright the second time round, I thought that it would be easier because he was a pastor and I was a Christian woman and a teacher. He was a social worker before he became a pastor. And I just thought we'd have all the skills we needed to live happily ever after. Unfortunately, Although we loved each other, the battles began straight away. We had different styles of parenting and we had different ideas about money. We had different ideas about where to live and what kind of possessions we should have. And I didn't know how to blend those things. And there was no one around who could help me or no one I could turn to because being a pastor's wife is actually a really lonely job. I've heard this. Let's talk about this a little bit more. So, because I've I've heard from many pastors' wives that the pressure is actually enormous to keep up your image. Um, why is it? Why are you under so much pressure? You think in that position? That's a really good question, Laura. I think some of the pressure is self-imposed, um, wanting to to look good, wanting to look perfect. And I think some of the pressure comes because of the nature of the job. The nature of the job for my husband is to lead people in good living and to show that love can conquer all and to show that God can enable, you know, triumph in the most challenging of situations. And when a pastor's wife or a pastor reveals that they're not getting along so well, that's a chink in that armour. And that's an opportunity for people to throw arrows of criticism. And whenever anybody's in a leadership role, there are always people who are looking to pull them down and to expose those chinks. So I wasn't aware of that when I got married to my husband because he wasn't a pastor. And I didn't know of all the baggage that comes along with that. However, my sister's husband is a pastor. And she was aware of all of that. And she had shared some of her story with me. And I did not want to be a pastor's wife for that reason. So I was dragged kicking and screaming into that role. And then 
just didn't know what to do, didn't know how to live it, didn't know how to talk to anyone. Yeah, so I felt very lonely and that's where I think the source of my loneliness was. I was not able to share my story with anyone, which is how I ended up on an international website where nobody knew me. Perfect, right? That is, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I had never considered that, but you're right. It was no one in your community was going to find out about this because you're talking to on the other side of the world to people uh, on our campus. So yeah, duly noted. So tell us, okay, so there was there a moment when you thought, okay, this is really untenable. We can't go on like this. I, I don't know what's going to happen now, but we can't sustain this. Mm, there are actually many moments like that. And I had secretly started researching other places to live and how to get an income of my own. I feel really guilty saying that now, but I was ready to light out of there and I just didn't know how to do it. And I didn't really want to do it. I married for life the first time, that failed. I married for life the second time and I didn't want to fail. So the moment that was crucial for me was one night the night before my husband and I were due to go on holidays to visit some girlfriends, they were 800 kilometers away. And I didn't know where he was. He'd gone to pick up something. There'd been some accident and he hadn't communicated with me. And then the next moment in the midst of all that that was going on for him, his son called me, He's my stepson, who had left the house six months earlier under stress from him and I Um, we'd had a huge fight and I get a phone call saying oh hi Deb I'm moving I'm coming for dinner I said oh great I look forward to seeing you he said yeah I've got all my stuff with me I went oh and I said he said yeah I'm moving back in didn't dad tell you and dad hadn't told me and he was moving back in and I just held it together and said great I'll see you when you get here bye and then I, I was home by myself. I just was so angry that I hadn't even been asked about this um, because I was so controlling. I didn't realize that he didn't even need to ask me about it, but it would have been nice to have a conversation. Anyway, I took a sleeping tablet and went to bed, cooked the dinner, left it on the table, went to bed. So I can't do this because I'm going to freak out and I don't want to have that kind of conversation. Next morning, I got up early, packed the car with all our things. My husband had eventually come home and gone to bed. And But there was something in the air. There was, just like you said before, you could have cut the tension with a knife. And he, I said, great, are you ready to go? Because he hadn't packed, um, hadn't organised anything, and we were going away for a fortnight. And he said, I'm not coming. I just looked at him. He said, I can't do this anymore. And I can't go on like this. And I just looked at him and I felt frozen. I felt like there was ice running through my body in every pore because I'd heard those exact same words 18 years earlier. Oh, yeah, that was the moment for me. I just got in that car and I drove. I'm like, you know what? I'm an independent woman. I'm going anyway. Packed my surfboard, packed my tent, packed my sleeping bag, and off I went. And I cried for the next 800 kilometres. I called into a women's refuge to get counselling. They didn't know how to help. I just thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself. I can't do this again. I can't let the world down. Such an overinflated ego. <laughs> mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, that was that was a turning point for me. And it was on that journey, like you said, that I found your book. And we'll get to that, I guess. But yeah, I mean, you say inflated ego, but uh, incredible heartbreak, right? It, it's also true. As I listen to the story, it's, I can feel yeah. it. I wonder how many buckets I would have filled on that 800 <laughs> My tears. It was like dehydrated by the time you arrived with your friends. Yeah. And, and I didn't even call to see if I'd got there safely. I didn't get there till midnight. It was a long journey. It was a 12 hour drive and um, by myself. And I didn't hear from him for the next five days. 
broke my heart. He like that was just a sign to me that, that he had given up. So you thought that maybe your marriage was over anyway, even though you hadn't had the heart to move out. Yeah, I did. I did not. Not be your choice. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right, Laura. I didn't think I had a choice anymore. That was humbling. What did you say to your friends when you got there? Well, it was a 50th, so it was a bit hard to start complaining straight away. So after the party. (laughs) Um, their four their four girlfriends and I are all staying in the one place together. It was great, actually. It was just so therapeutic. It was like self care laid on without even meaning it. And my spirit started to come back a little bit. My girlfriends listened to my story, and they said, "Yeah, I don't know what to do. My marriage is the same. There's a wall." I told them about the weeks of silence treatments that I could sometimes go through. Because I would have a, something would happen, I would flare up in criticism and he would take the position of the hurt man and not speak to me for sometimes three weeks. And because he's, he's a very strong character, which I really admire in him, but I'm not as strong as him in that way. Other ways, yes. And so instead of the, what they could see was what I could see, which was, Yes, the initial action that I'd reaction, reacted to had, was a problem from anybody's point of view, but it was my reaction that was getting all the attention instead of the problem. And I didn't know how to change that, and they didn't know how to change that. But as I listened to it, it doesn't sound that bad. You made dinner, went to bed early. There was, was there a meltdown? Did I miss it? There was a potential meltdown, <laughs> and that's what he was reacting to. All right. His reaction, this is what I mean. It was like the fight you have without having a fight. He was. He knew that I was upset because I'd gone to bed without conversation, and he knew that it was because he'd invited his son back home without even having a conversation about that. And I think that, you know, his idea of being respected is that he could do what he wants in his own house. Nothing wrong with that. And I was walking all over that with my hobnail boots covered with slippers because I was, in fact, saying, no, that's not okay. It's not okay that you've invited your son back here, even though he's your son and this is our house. So he's as much right to invite people in as I do. So it may not sound like there's anything going on, but there was all this burbling along under the surface. There was 10 years of conflict over children. So this was just the latest, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. And there's always a straw, isn't there? There is always a straw, and this was yours. And I, and I think I've, I, I mean, I've certainly had the fight, the fight with no words. It's, it's a look. It's, a, it's the way I walk. It's the way I'm, you know, my body language. Uh, so, and it, it can, they're enormously stressful. So I just, but I just wanted to highlight that that it doesn't, doesn't sound like you were so bad that night. But I, but I get that. Uh, Anyway, you're very accountable now, so I'm sure we'll we'll hear more about that. But um, so so what happened? What happened next? Well, the next part's the good part. So I'm kind of glad that we've got the ugly part out of the way. Um, it, it was a bit of a from that point on. <clears throat> I stayed with my girlfriends for four days, and I had my car, and I had my surfboard, and I had my tent. And I decided that I was going to go on a solo surfing safari, my first one ever. Um, I've been a surfer for probably 20 years and um, I didn't start till late in life, but hey, that's okay. And um, I had never been on a surfing safari and it was pretty scary because Australia is a very big place and there's lots and lots of beaches that have nobody on them ever. And... I decided that I was going to explore them. So I started making my way south and from Queensland and surfing at different places and it gave me lots of time to think and it gave me lots of time to reflect on what a strong and courageous woman I really am. That is my nature. I'm a brave person at heart. And being a brave person at heart and also being a teacher 
when I'm faced with a problem, I look for solutions. I don't get overwhelmed by the problem. And I had become that person. I had become overwhelmed. I mean, I'm able to go out in eight-foot waves and conquer and get smashed and bob up again. And that's my nature. And I thought, I am not going to let this defeat me. Right, what do you do when you have a problem? You read a book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or you ask good. <laughs> and um, so I drove a few hundred kilometres and ended up in a bookstore in a place called Coffs Harbour. And there on the shelf in the self-help section was the title, First Kill All the Marriage Counsellors. <laughs> I love that title. It really worked for me because I felt really aggressive. <laughs> And my husband would not go to marriage counselling, even though I had begged with him. He'd had a terrible experience prior to our marriage in going to marriage counselling where he'd been called a misogynist and his wife's counsellor had encouraged her to get away from him and there was no fixing of the marriage. And and that, to be honest, was not my experience of this wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, he's a strong character, but so am I. We're well-matched. So I picked up this book and when I went up to the counter, I love this little story, the lady said to me, oh, look at that, she said, I think I need 10 of those books to fix my marriage, (laughs) which was really funny. So I took the book to a coffee shop and I started reading. And oh my gosh, Laura, are you sure you were not fly on the wall in both my marriages? (laughs) I might have been. I (laughs) can't. I can't deny or confirm any such accusations. So those alien powers of yours. And so um, I started reading this book and, of course, I didn't know you at that point. And I was just dumbstruck by how you got me. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a successful professional woman and and you have lots of understanding and lots of knowledge. And yet there was this area of your life that you had to do some research on and figure it out. And that really resonated with me. And I found that your words of wisdom were like balm. I thought maybe, just maybe, there's a way out of this. And so I picked up my phone. I read the whole book, about three cups of coffee and a whole bunch of humble pie. (laughs) Right? (laughs) It's like all broccoli and Brussels sprouts. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's, it's not painful. my favorite food. Painful <laughs> thing, it is, yeah. And, and yeah. Um, I apologize for anybody who actually loves those vegetables. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I read this book and then I texted my first apology to my husband. It felt like gravel in my fingertips. <laughs> I said, I apologize for disrespecting you when I didn't want Stephen to come back and live with us. And I heard from him like that. He must have been sitting by his phone waiting for some kind of message because immediately his heart was in the message and he said, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. How are you? And it just came forth with all of this conversation. So I thought, oh, my goodness, this stuff works by text. Unbelievable. So that was the start of my journey. And, and yeah, so the next few days uh, I decided, he said to me, stay on your surfing safari. I think it's really time. You deserve a holiday and you've been working really hard. And so I thought I'm going to try this out a little bit. I'm going to express some desires here and see what happens. So I said, well, I've got my tent. I've got my surfboard. I said, but I'd love to stay in a motel. We didn't have much money being, you know, a pastoring couple. And he immediately texted back, don't you dare stay in a tent. You must book a hotel room and all this kind of stuff. And, like, this was amazing. So I thought I'm going to keep on going with this. So I tried a bit of vulnerability. Oh, I'm a bit scared of camping anyway, which wasn't entirely true. But (laughs) I'll try it out. (laughs) And, um yeah, no, don't do anything that's too scary. And so I just got this. I just tried each skill in turn by text. And, yeah, I got all these amazing responses. So about five days later, as I was surfing my way down the coast, he said, can I come and see you? And I'm like, okay. And so he came up 24 hours later 
We had a wonderful 24 hours and then he criticised me for something. I drove because we had two cars and I got too far ahead of him and his car broke down and and guess what? The next two days were absolutely terrible. There was just huge a, a huge meltdown on my side and lack of empathy from him and I just thought, I can't do this. I can't do this by myself. And that's when I I think I called Kathy Murray and we had a discovery call. And that was the beginning of my journey with Laura Doyle, Inc. <laughs> wow. So what happened? You Did you get a coach first or you came right into coach training? I came right straight into coach training because at that point you could do that. And I also realised that as far as I knew, there was nobody else in Australia who was a coach. And at that time. That's right. You were the first. Yeah. You were the first. Yeah. And. And I also thought, you know what, there's a huge need for these skills in my community and as a pastor's wife I have lots of opportunity to lead and to speak into other ladies' lives. And so I thought this is probably going to be a really good investment. And I imagine if it works it's cheaper than divorce, so. <laughs> which is absolutely true. <laughs> so. Yes. And so, so how did training to become a coach impact your marriage because you had some initial success but then it sounds like it got pretty discouraging again yeah well part of the problem was the money now my mother had left me when she died she left me some money and she said keep this money to yourself and use it for emergencies so I had done that and I decided this was an emergency my marriage was so important to me that I wanted to use my emergency money my escape pod and um So I invested all of that in the coach training and then I couldn't really tell my husband that I'd done that because, A, he didn't know about the money and, B, um, it works better if you don't actually say, well, that's what I was told, it works better if you say, hey, if you don't say, guess what, I'm getting relationship training so I can be a wonderful wife. And I didn't want him to point the finger at me when I failed yet again and say, you're supposed to be better than this, um, which I was worried about. So not that he's ever done that, but he he might have. Yeah. And so I went straight into coach training for that reason. Yeah. For those reasons. So what did you start to do differently in coach training? Self-care. What was self-care? <laughs> I'd never even heard of self-care before I started this training. And I realized that I'd had my muffin upside down. Yeah, okay, no, I don't I have no idea what you're talking about. What does that mean to have your muffin upside down? <laughs> um what's, what's your favorite muffin? Uh I'll say blueberry is quite delicious. Blueberry's nice, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now on my muffins, I always like to have a little something tasty on top. Um so if I have a blueberry muffin, I like that sort of sugary icing that you get on top. Sure. Here, here. I realized that my life was a lot like a muffin. And the things that go to make up the best part of the muffin, the most of the muffin, are actually all the important healthy ingredients. I like a healthy muffin, and I'll accept the icing part. And I realised that I'd had my muffin all upside down because that cherry on top of your muffin, that's the really tasty bit that I, you know, like or whatever it is, whatever it is, it's your favourite thing. And for me, my marriage is that cherry. But what I had been doing was being was putting all of my emphasis for my happiness on that cherry instead of realizing that the bulk of my life is actually up to me. It's up to me to get the ingredients of the muffin, the self-care, the self-respect, my relationships. It's up to me to get those things in balance. And then whatever my other half brings to the relationship. That's the cherry. And that to me is having my muffin in balance. If I do it the other way and I think that all my nutrition and goodness comes from the cherry, that poor cherry is just not up to the job, right? So for me, understanding that it's my job to be happy and not my husband's job to make me happy was probably the biggest skill for me and it took a lot of the pressure off the marriage. A lot of the pressure. How did you and make yourself happy? 
Well, I joined a choir. Mm. So I started making sure that I was getting enough sleep. I have regular weekly massages, at least I did pre-COVID-19. They start back tomorrow. I'm getting pretty good. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah. And I left my job. So mm. I had a job at an exclusive boys' school, um, very well-paid job. And I said to my husband, this was sort of 10 months into the training, I said, I'm exhausted. I can't do this anymore. And lo and behold, he leapt to the party and said, that's so good. I'm so glad. He said, I didn't like you working so hard and I'll pick up the shortfall in our finances. And I trusted him to do that. And, so yeah, I started living in a way that was sustainable so I wasn't so exhausted all the time. I swim regularly. I walk regularly. And I just I started enjoying my life in a way that I never had before. I was all work-oriented before. And how did your husband respond to this? I love his response to you quitting your job, but how mm. did he respond to you being happier? There was a lot of bait. He was used to our old conflictual relationship. He knew where he stood in that relationship. He didn't quite know what to do with this happy woman in his life. Isn't that weird? It made him nervous that you were so happy. Definitely did. It, it also, when I stopped, when I duct taped, so I started slapping on the duct tape whenever I felt critical words coming out of my mouth. And when I started not responding to his bait, his bait went up and up and up. And one day in the middle of his criticism, I said, I can't do this right now. And I walked off into a different room, actually the room I'm sitting in right now. And he followed me and wanted to keep criticizing me. And I'm like, I can't do this. I said, I can't listen to this right now because I could feel my anger rising and I didn't want to go back to that shrieking shrew that I had been previously. It had taken me a long time to shift that. And finally he followed me back to this room and came in. I'm like, I turned around and I yelled in his face, I don't do this anymore. Like, whoops. And then I grabbed my car keys and got into the got into the car and raced off screechingly gravelly on our gravel driveway and drove away. Because I just had to get out of there. And I just went and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. And that was a turning point in our relationship. Because he realized how hard I was trying to be the change I wanted to see. And yeah, he just, there was some vulnerability in it, in a way. It was the best you could muster at that point, but you really did muster all the courage and the strength you could at that time to not. Yeah, I didn't fight back. I did you yell didn't it. Fight back. You didn't fight back. No. You didn't. You didn't lose your dignity, even though you yelled, and it might not have been so pretty. But there was nothing to clean up later, right? There was nothing to apologize for later. Your side of the street was still clean. Well, not as much. I did still storm off. <laughs> well, uh, that's a good point. All yeah. right. Fair, fair. Yeah, I get it. And it, it, is, it does take something to change the old dance. And that was, so that was the turning point. You changed the dance mm. that day. Yeah. And we started, I started to see changes in him. I think up until that point, he'd been trying to draw me back into the old dance. And I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to be that undignified, horrible person that I'd become. And, yeah, and I'm so thankful for the skills because now I'm not that person. I occasionally lose my bundle. I really do. I lost my bundle four weeks ago and I said some awful things. But with skills, I had the opportunity to clean up my side of the street, to apologise for my behaviour. and then while he's processing his hurt, because I was pretty hurtful, instead of me getting lost in the vortex of the silent treatment, which is what used to happen to me, which would then trigger me into another outburst, this time I was able to go and do self-care and process my own side of things without getting back into another argument about the silent treatment. And so I enable his space in a way that I was not able to do before. And that is the skills right there. 
because it took a long time to get through this most recent episode, which there was a reason for. But nonetheless, my side of the street is my side of the street. And thankfully, that is all I am responsible for. This is really interesting too. And you you have spoken in the past about getting clarity about what was your fault and what wasn't your fault through using the skills. Tell us a little bit about that. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's been one of the most healing aspects of the skills for me. I have a very beautiful family growing up, but because I was so much like my father and he wanted me to be better than him, he criticised me a lot because it was out of love. He wanted me to be improved. And I really love him for that. But at the same time, I am super sensitive to criticism. And so I can get triggered by implied criticism or direct criticism. And what I've realized because of the skills is that I can choose how to respond to criticism until I've had a chance to reflect upon what's been said or done. And I can say, I can own whether or not I've actually at fault. So the things I think that one of the things that the skills has helped me with, self-care, obviously, but also the other one is discernment. Because my behaviour is so much better (laughs) than it used to be, um, I, I am a lot more generous in my thinking towards my husband than I used to be. I now understand his motivation comes out of love or I choose to think that his motivation comes out of love or something positive rather than something selfish or negative, which is what my go-to used to be, I can now um, discern whether my response is out of love or some other negative emotion. And if it's out of love, if I have done something uh, which he finds annoying but my motivation was love, then my side of the street is clean. And so for me, understanding, being able to discern where I'm acting well and where I'm not acting well and what I need to apologise for has allowed me to see that not every problem in relationship is actually my fault. It's just not, whereas I thought it was before this point. And so The next stage of that is that when my husband quips me about something, which bless his heart he does because I'm not a perfect woman, I can now discern whether that criticism is because he's got some issue that he needs to work through or whether it's my issue that I actually need to work on. And so I'm no longer triggered to the same degree as I used to be. Does that make any sense at all? It does. I mean, getting a sense of a kind of an inner sanctuary that you have the ability to be discerning and generous, more generous, because there's some inner safety Mm. that's been developed. So what is your relationship like now? There's still breakdowns, of course. No marriage is perfect. Go ahead. What's it like? acknowledging that actually I think that's one of the things I really love about this program is that I just want to reflect back to what you said no marriage is perfect one of the things I love about the coaching program is that there's an honesty amongst the coaches both towards each other and towards the clients about the fact that life is a journey and we take two steps forward and one step back on a constant basis but that's still progress so what is my marriage like now um I would say that for the most part my marriage is peaceful, which is what I was longing for. I would say that my husband keeps on stepping up to show that he loves me and I would uh, certainly things on the intimacy level 3 million percent better than what they were prior to the skills when pretty much he didn't want anything to do with me. Um, And... You know, the biggest change, this is going to sound really strange, but before the skills, so I've been doing the skills now for I think it'll be six years in October. Before the skills, he used to say to me, I hate being in the car with you. Every car trip is horrible with you. 
because that used to be the place where I could corner him and talk about problems. <laughs> uh, true confessions. And, oh, she's pointing to herself, ladies. I know you can't hear that. <laughs> right, right. Same, same. Yeah. And, and now we go for drives all the time and we have a great time. And I do apply the duct tape when he says things which I find outrageous. But at the same time, um, it's peaceful and it's, we have a nice time together. I just have found that I don't need to discuss all the issues that I think are a problem anymore. They haven't gone away. They just don't need to be talked about. What happens to those issues then if you don't talk about them? Well, mostly they just don't matter that much. And I thought they did. <laughs> okay, so, so they shrink a bit, it sounds like, from lack of uh, attention and conversation. That's a good way of looking at it. And I'm working on shrinking them even further. So there are still things like tissues around the house and toothpicks which drive me up the wall. But I let him be who he is and love him regardless or I can choose and and I can focus on the things that are fantastic or I can choose to nitpick and focus on the few, very few things that are quote-unquote wrong with him. Uh, My perspectacles have changed. Yes, yes. And I think for any of us who've lived through something less than a peaceful marriage, right, with a lot of conflict and stress and hostility, it's quite the prize to be able to create a peaceful marriage where there there wasn't one mm-hmm. before. So if you were going to give out a tip to a woman who's still in the hostile, stressful, why don't we break up sort of state that you started out in? What would you say to her? Surround yourself with people who stand for your marriage because I had a number of people both before and since saying, you should just leave, but that's not the solution for me. And I would say that there are more people invested in breaking marriages up than there are in keeping people together. And there is a way forward. You know, my husband is a very strong character. And so am I, if I'm honest. And I needed other strong women to guide me how to be both strong and peaceful at the same time. And that's what coaches are. They're all strong women, but they're all women who have been humbled by their situations. You know, I think the difference between someone who is strong and someone who isn't is that the problems are real, but the strong people stay the course. And that's what you get when you get coaching. Strong women who acknowledge their fault, acknowledge their disrespect, and who work on themselves and encourage other people to do the same. And it's the working on myself that has brought the peace, not waiting for my husband to change. And that is amazing. <laughs> You sound very empowered, Deb. I love that. What what would you say to Deb from before, if you could go back and talk to her now? What would you say to her? Oh, wow. I'd say, Deb, I'm really proud of you because you wanted to leave and you found it within you to stay and work this out. Not everything in the world is your fault and there is a way forward. And I would love on myself, just like I've been loved on in this coaching program. (laughs) Beautiful, beautiful. It is a, yeah, it is a, what a great idea to just go back and give her, I think about that for myself too. Like, I just want to go back and give the younger version of myself a big hug and say, ah, there's, there's hope and Yeah. yeah, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. It's beautiful sentiment. This reward for me has been watching my four girls, two steps and two birth children, get married. Because as a result of my first marriage breaking down and my second marriage being such a nightmare for 10 years, there were good parts, but largely it was conflictual. As a result of that, my four girls didn't want to get married. All four of them thought marriage just sucks, we're so not doing this. And since 
I started the program and they've seen the transformation in our life. All four of those girls have married. They've all bitten the bullet and got married. They're all Laura Doyle fans and doing it away. And I've shared with them the skills and continue to share with them the skills. And they, you know, I used to have such a conflictual relationship with each of them because I'm so freaking controlling. And now we just love on each other every chance we get. It's amazing. Wow. So I just love the way that for me that's even, dare I say it, more exciting than my marriage because my relationships with my daughters, my sisters, my friends, they've just, it's changed. Wow. So you've transformed your whole family. Yeah. It's not just your marriage just has this amazing spin-off into your life once you start to get the skills on the belt. And as a pastor's wife, you have an image to maintain, and yet we've talked about very intimate, personal things today. Um, why would you do such a thing? This podcast reaches Australia. <gasps> <laughs> I thought no one would ever know. <laughs> um, why would I do such a thing? Look, I think carrots are better than sticks. That's how I think. And I think that if my life, which is complicated, I mean, I have nine children, I'm married to a pastor, um, you know, I'm out there for display, and if my marriage can change, pretty much anybody's can. If I can change, anybody can. So, yeah, I just want to encourage people that change is possible and beautiful, and worthwhile seeking after. And it's only on the other side of staying in your marriage, being committed, and being strong and courageous that you get there. Yeah, that's right. You're a, a role model for that, for sure. And it is, uh, it is inspiring. It is encouraging to hear your story, Deb, and all that you've been through and how you stayed the course. And... Uh, not only created a peaceful marriage, but it sounds like created a more loving family overall. Yeah. I've had a lot of apologizing to do, but once you've done that, you've cleared the way for building. It's like getting rid of the rubble before you can plant some good foundation and build an even better building than the one that you thought was okay. Yeah. Everybody wants to be around someone who's humble and accountable enough to apologize to own their part. And it sounds like that's what you've done. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you really wanted to find out, you'd have to talk to them. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to interview them next. So. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Well, Deb, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for sharing your story. You're very welcome. It's been um, beautiful, actually, to, for me to hear myself talk about the journey. Yes, yes, to own all the pieces of the story and put them all together in one place, just gather them together like that. Very gratifying. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. The advice that's got me indignant this week is don't put off bringing up an issue with your partner. The idea here is that if you don't bring things up on a regular basis, they'll pile up and you'll get overwhelmed and you'll explode, causing a big blow up. It sounds pretty logical, right? But the problem with this advice is the implication that, first of all, your issue is definitely with your partner. We'll get to that in a minute. But the second problem is that this oft-repeated advice that telling him what to do differently will somehow solve your issue 
never actually works. At least it never did for me. I tried it lots of times, not effective. For one thing, a lot of my issues that I thought were with my partner weren't with my partner at all. My issues were with me, like I needed a nap. He just happened to be there when I was overworked, stressed, tired, or caught up in needless emotional turmoil. So then I was addressing an issue with him that he couldn't fix. But I not only thought he could, I thought he should. And then when he didn't, because he couldn't, that made me really mad and scared and sad. And that was the recipe for rage that caused me to do the very thing this advice is supposed to prevent explode like a bonfire at the dynamite factory. It was not pretty. But the other insidious part about this advice is that if you do have an issue with your husband that you want to improve, the way to do it is to, quote, address it. We all know what that means. You must criticize him so he knows how he's falling short and failing you. And that has never been effective for me either or for my students. Criticizing and complaining not only made us sound like our mothers on her worst day, it didn't resolve the issue. Our husbands just got defensive or distant. So then we had the original problem plus this new problem of a conflict in our marriages. Now, if the advice was, if you're feeling like you have an issue with your partner, go take a nap or a walk, or go watch some cat videos, and let's see if the world looks any better, well, it would not be winning this infamous award today. Or if the advice was, be sure to express your desires in a way that inspires instead of buttoning them up and trying to squish them down, well then yes, yes, I am completely on board. Your husband needs to know how to be your hero, and he won't know unless you share what will make you ridiculously happy. But to say, hey, you're feeling out of sorts, be sure to lash out at your husband about it and criticize him for a shortcoming sooner rather than later. That would cost me a lot of intimacy in my marriage. It would also cause me to lose my dignity and feel like a shrew and say things I regret. And I don't miss feeling like that at all. And for that reason, the advice that you should not put off bringing up an issue with your partner is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share 15 signs that you're not controlling. I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I bought a special pillowcase that prevents wrinkles and I don't know why it's not working. 